All right, good evening to everyone on the stream right now. Welcome to our Q&A for January 2019, our first Q&A of the year. But before that, let's have a quick message from a very old and familiar face. That's right, this is me from, what, four years ago. That is kind of funny because I didn't originally make this channel for Archery. Nonetheless, this isn't a bad thing. It's been a very unique experience and I've had the opportunity to share my passion and my interests with thousands of people worldwide. And look, I'm a pretty young guy. You'll probably get another 50 or so years of content out of me for free. As of this video, the channel has reached nearly 20,000 subscribers and over 3.5 million views. There's been a wait, wait, how many subscribers does that have then? <laughs> wait, wait, how much? Views. Wait, wait. Nearly 20, subscribers. Holy crap, that was on the 12th of June 2016. And I was just celebrating what 20,000 subscribers. How's that for throwback, people? How is that? Wow, that was what, what just, just over two years ago. And here we are on the eve of, well, not quite the eve, but frigly, figuratively speaking, the eve of the 100,000 milestone. We won't get it tonight, but the estimates will be in the next, what, six days or so, depending on how viral I go. But the reason I wanted to show that is because one of the things I keep on wanting to do is to relaunch the Shirt Out project. I was a much smaller channel back then, and if you look at what happened here, like what I wanted to do was collect shirts from archery clubs and organizations from around the world. And I got quite a few. I'll relaunch this at a different time, but I do want to, again, call you back to what I originally wanted to do. Um, a few people have sent me shirts since, uh, and I do rotate through them throughout the, uh, the, um, the streams and throughout the videos, tutorials. And it's a nice little fun thing to do. It's not really meant to be promotion. It's more meant to be uh, about just, you know, having that uh, Easter egg or that cameo appearance. So that's there. Um, I'm going to relaunch it at some point when I remember to do so. But that was me uh, being a little enthusiastic about spreading the archery love uh, back in 2016. And that was when I was just 20,000 subs large. And here we are today. So, welcome to everyone. Uh, it's nice to see uh, some very familiar faces, uh, some a bit too familiar, Thomas, uh, but a lot of you are regular viewers and a lot of you are enjoying this. So, this is our last Q&A before the 100,000 milestone. Uh, I'll try to figure out um, where to put the silver plaque once it comes. I'm thinking of putting it somewhere at school, like on the window or something, so all the students go past and take photos of it or something. I don't know. I'll think about it. Um, how's the weather here? Uh, well, here, it's been weird, um, as Australia or Melbourne is known for. So it's been, what, 40-plus degrees Celsius for the last couple of days, and it's dropped to a nice cool 28 degrees, cool, relatively speaking. Uh, when you have like a 40 degree like morning, and you have a 29 degree afternoon, that's a pretty cool change, um, <laughs> uh, in terms of how relative it is, and it does feel really nice. Uh, it's a pretty cool evening tonight, it's probably, about, probably 19 degrees tonight, so it's dropped quite a fair bit, should be quite uncomfortable, uh, quite comfortable rather. So, uh, we'll try and fly through uh, quite a few of our questions today um, and we'll probably spend a bit more time talking about other questions and other things um, afterwards so we'll try and get through as much as we can I'll probably uh, do some short um, answers this time because we tend to uh, blab on a lot so I'm trying to balance out a bit more uh, but we'll take some more live questions and towards the end we'll kick back and we'll have a bit more of a relaxed Q&A given that this is meant to be the celebratory live stream um, not that I'm counting too much but um, uh, for those who have been missing the last few streams um, the 100k milestone is kind of like end game for me it's like how you play 
a, a single player campaign, like, especially when you play like a, a strategy game like um, uh, EU4 or and I'm playing um, Attila Total War at the moment, then you meet that first vic victory condition and then you have the option of playing on and that's kind of what I'm doing with the channel. So what the 100k is the victory condition and then we'll try to um, you know see what happens afterwards. So let's have a look at what we are doing here. By the way, hello to Jensen Tong. That's your special request there. So let's have a look firstly at the Facebook questions. There are only a few here. Um, let's have a look. So um, there are a few interesting questions from the Facebook side and we'll flash these on the screen as we can see. Oh man, just as a bit of a sidetrack, do you remember back when I did these as pre-prepared questions and we had the uh, questions on the bottom of the video and I just go through like 10 questions at a time? Man, those were the days. Now it's all live streaming stuff. Uh, quick question from Euron. Uh, what are the advantages of a 45 uh degree stabilizer instead of 35 degrees there's no advantage per se like it all depends on how much you want to bring your weight sideways and forward so some people might find a wider v-bar to be more stable so there's less movement um, on the horizontal skull or this axis rather um, others prefer something a bit narrower but it, it all depends um, there, there's no like, advantage it's what you feel is right uh, what i probably recommend is you get the first part um, like just figure it out first uh, with any set of v-bars and stabilizers and then mix and match as it go along um, oh, Thomas, quick question from you. All right, so uh, what's my favorite historic topic to teach? Oh, great, history topics. Um, I'm going to say my favorite topic would probably be World War II. Um, I, I used to be a World War II nut when I was like in school, when I was in year 9 and year 10. Um, I used to love World War II because the thing that came out when I was in school was Saving Private Ryan. You know this as well as I do. So, Saving Private Ryan was, was that 1997? I keep forgetting, it was 1999. I was in primary school, but when I was in like year 8 or year 9, my brother introduced me to Saving Private Ryan. And uh, it was amazing. And um, I played Medal of Honor, the very first Medal of Honor on PlayStation. Played Medal of Honor Underground. Um, we played Medal of Honor Frontline on PS2 and uh, Ally Assault. Um, uh, and then we, we Call of Duty came out, the first Call of Duty. So, like, we, we are, like every world, that was the World War II saturation. So, every game, every move is World War II. Um, and that's kind of what got me into um, the World War II scene and the history scene. Um, I ended up doing a study in history. I did World War II in university. And that was kind of my, um, my geek out. So, some people geek out on Star Trek and Star Wars. I geeked out on World War II. Like, I could memorize all the weapons and calibers and all that it was really fun um so that's kind of what i like to teach the most the problem with teaching in school is that you only get like a term or something and like you can spend like uh, uh, most of your life studying world war ii or, or any period in history like i did medieval history vietnam war american civil war um the world war ii we did uh, renaissance all these things you could study for years, but we only teach in like what five weeks or something. So it's, it's hardly doing it justice. Um, and, and those wondering what we teach in school on the chat here, like we teach um, like five or six topics in like one term. It's really, really crammed in. So instead of spending like a, a whole um, 10 week semester on like World War II um, politics, we have to like do that in 15 minutes. So it's pretty tight. Um, did I play Call of Duty World War Two? I played about half of it. Um, I I really disliked Call of Duty after Modern Warfare Two, um, and World War Two I didn't really enjoy as a game. Um, I might go back to it and finish it off, but never really liked Call of Duty World War Two. Uh, I I was much much more of the original Call of Duty. Um, we call it Call of Duty Classic now, but Call of Duty um, Classic and um, the expansion uh, United Offensive. Um, and then Call of Duty 2 is pretty good as well. Um, and then things went down here from there, because um, Call of Duty 3 was p console only for some reason. Um, didn't come on PC, it was a bit of a strange gap. Because that was a decent game actually, but um, yeah, then Modern Warfare came out, and then World at War was badass. Um, then Modern Warfare 2. So I had quite a few things there. Uh, am I excited for Yakuza Kiwami? Yeah. I mean, I, I always knew it was coming out, so it wasn't really recent news. Um, it 
Um, what was I? I? I know Sega is had already planned Kiwami's release in PC. So they released Kiwami, like they released Yakuza Six, then Zero, then Kiwami, which is the remake of One on console ages ago. Um, so and and Kiwami has the uh, plot line for um, Majima uh, in the in the game, uh, but it's a PC game. I completely missed out. What I'm more hopeful is that they'll release um, Kiwami Two and they'll remake all the or the remaster all the um, Yakuza games for PC. So hopefully it sells well. Um, that way there's more interest in it. Um, Nathan, did I know that Wellington wanted archers? I've seen the quote, I've seen this mentioned, I couldn't find the original quote where it comes from. So that's why I didn't mention it in the video itself, because um, it, um, I couldn't verify the quote, and rather than just uh, quote um, pop culture and uh, uh, popular uh, myths, I just wanted to keep it straightforward. It is recorded that Benjamin Franklin wanted archers in the American army, Not, I can't verify um, what uh, Wilton exactly said, but that's been a popular um, uh, quoted or um, referenced uh, event. Sorry, no gas Um That was a popular event, um, uh, and yeah, I, that that's that's kind of what prompted it. Um, my, I originally wanted to call the video um, "Why didn't Napoleon use archers?" or "Why didn't Wellington use archers?" But because I couldn't verify the source, um, I decided to go for more neutral and a bit more objective um, uh, topic. Um, Sammy, uh, the two views of the A bombs or the um, Russian threat. What I studied in university was um, the the evidence that presented itself, and from what I recall from the from the study, um, before the atomic bombs were dropped, the Japanese cabinet was deadlocked on whether they should surrender or not surrender. Um, if, after the atomic bombs, it was still deadlocked, and from what the uh, the Japanese government had um, evaluated was that. Well, the bomb was probably made in Germany, and the Americans um, only had one. They were close. They had two, but that's all they had. Um, so just piecing the evidence together, um, I'm more inclined to believe that the Japanese were trying to hold out for favorable surrender terms um, with Russia, or with the USSR, but when the USSR declared war and invaded Manchuria, that was endgame for Japan. So I'm more inclined to think that the Japanese surrender happened because of the Soviet declaration of war, um, whereas at the time, the atomic bombs did not do as much damage compared to other bombing campaigns, especially the fire bombing of Tokyo. So to a person or to a government which did not know about atomic bombs, um, they probably didn't consider it to be a super weapon. It was a very destructive bombing campaign, and the actual effects immediately were no worse than, they were terrible, but no worse than other bombing campaigns um, or missions done by the Allies. So that's why I'm more inclined to believe uh, that the Japanese surrendered as a result of a combination of factors, but mostly the political isolation after the Soviet incursion in Manchuria. Um, that's, that's what I, I'm inclined to believe. Um, but you know, we don't know for sure, but I wouldn't teach the fact that the bombs brought the end of the war. I'll, I'll pitch the possibility, but not the fact, because that's not proven to be fact. Uh, Panda makes a mention, uh, Japan never actually invaded anyone, only bombed Australia. Uh, they invaded a lot of countries, not sure what you mean by <laughs> only bombed, they, they didn't invade Australia, yes, they didn't invade Australia, in fact the Japanese had no plan to invade Australia, um, the closest was in Papua New Guinea, because that was at the time the Australian protectorate. So not quite Australia, but that's close enough. Um, and they, they, they bombed Darwin, and they did send two midget submarines in Sydney, but they didn't invade Australia, correct? But they invaded everyone else. So China, um, Korea was way before, but China, in India, China, Indonesia, the Philippines, plenty of invasions. So not sure what we mean by not invading anybody. They definitely did invade, uh, you know, most of Eastern Asia. 
Um, that, that's kind of what brought about the um, Cold War and the political climate uh, in the in Southeast Asia at the time, which led to the formation of modern Vietnam through a lot of very roundabout series of events. Um, a question from Gabriel. Uh, why is the arrow cut out to the left of a right-hand riser and to the right of a left-hand riser? Um, that's because uh, cut-up bows are designed to be shot with the Mediterranean draw. Um, that's the style and the culture which spawn that sort of archery. So because if a right-hand archer, you normally load on the or knock on the left side uh, of the uh, uh, riser, then it makes sense to put the cutter on the left side. There's really no reason to put the cutter on the right side. In addition, a secondary function of the cutter is to provide a sight window, so you can sight the target through the, the, the center shot. So if you put the cutter on the wrong side, the riser blocks the uh, line of sight. Now, um, if you are shooting with a thumb draw, you don't need a cutout because you're not aiming with the arrow, um, and you're not really affected by the need to compensate for the artist paradox anymore. So um, that's why that's the case, because that's the side you put the arrow on. That makes a lot more sense. Um, what else is here? Nathan, uh, as an experienced archer, can you watch shows like Arrow or movies like Robin Hood and obsess over the mistakes to make in them? The answer is yes. Um, I, I don't, I'm not a stickler for details. Um, some people get really pedantic about things like guns or martial arts or explosions. I like to understand and learn from it, but I don't, I don't nitpick things. I just go, oh yeah, it's a movie. I can detach myself. So watching things like Lord of the Rings, um, I don't give a crap, but like, you know, uh, Legolas is Legolas. He does his thing. Um, uh, I only nitpicked on, um, uh, the Hobbit, um, uh, Battle of Five Armies, the, uh, the bard scene. I nitpick that because it's not so much uh, like an archery nitpick, but it's more that it's a loss of continuity. That's what kind of annoyed me more. They introduced um, the super weapon in the second movie, but they didn't use it in the third movie, which is the whole point of bringing down a dragon. So somehow they've used uh, this to make it work. So it was more about continuity and filmmaking and screenwriting rather than the archery itself. But the archery itself was the, uh, the consequence of that. Um, so, uh, that was the original, uh, well, that, that's the set of questions. Let's go to our uh, prepared questions. We can fly through these. First one, I'll fly through quickly. Um, uh, Sean asked about front of center. The reason I'm not going to answer this question very specifically is because front of center is much more important for a bow hunter. Uh, as a target shooter, we don't normally deal with front of center. So this one, I would not answer personally. I would leave it to somebody else who's more knowledgeable to answer in proper detail because I've never measured front of center with a target bow. We don't care about that. Uh, we don't care about um, the things that... Like, like we have a sight and we shoot long distance, but front of center doesn't actually matter for us. So that's my first uh, quick answer. Second one from Ronald. Uh, what is your absolute worst holy smokes Batman that could have gone terribly wrong moment you've experienced during an archery session taking near miss near death experiences for educational purposes? Um, what is the nearest holy crap moment? Um, hmm. Hmm. Uh, we've largely avoided it. Like we, I've heard my own coach um, has been shot at um, in the past. So like some kid had you know, shot an arrow while he was still at the target and he kicked him off. So, But I myself haven't had a holy crap that could have gone wrong moment. Let's see some close ones. The closest one I've personally had. Okay, I, I probably, there's probably two which I've personally had. One involves myself um, and that's when uh, my carbon arrow, my, AC, my ACE, um, actually splintered on release. You know those um, shots where you have the carbon arrow through your hand? That was nearly what my I experienced. So for some reason that there was a fault or failure in the carbon arrow um, and the thing split the three parts on release. It went crack. Um, it, it's not a dry fire, it's just a very loud crack and the arrow is in three pieces. I couldn't see it when I was, I, I thought where's the arrow, where'd the arrow go? As I walked up the target, I could see the the butt, the, the end bit, and the middle bit, and the front bit, and that was pretty weird. So um, that was like I was pretty young and in inexperienced archer. Learned a lot about checking your arrows for damage because so I've been hitting my ACs a lot. Didn't think it would actually destroy the arrow, but when shooting the damage shaft, yes, it blew up. 
So I've had an exploding arrow, um, or even worse, a carbon explosion uh, right in front of my face. So that could have been very nasty. The other one that involves somebody else wasn't really a, a bad one, but um, back when we had a static shooting, li a static target line. Um, we were shooting at different lanes. Um, I was shooting one target. Um, one of my friends was shooting the other target, and he was like half asleep. So he dazed out. He wandered across my shooting lane um, when I was at full draw, um, and yeah, that was. I mean, I saw him, so I, I stopped the shot. But uh, that that was kind of off putting because that was like half a second away from uh, release, and the, the clicker was going to go off, and it would have sent the arrow towards his um, the front of his face. So that was uh, a little scary then. So we we, uh, we obviously tried to make things very strict. It was kind of after hours, casual shooting, and he was half asleep. I wasn't, and thankfully that worked out fine. Um, probably the only other thing to mention at the club would be um, the holes in the shed. Um, a lot of people mention you know, the, the holes you see with lights poking through. And each hole has a story, um, but a lot of uh, times I've had we've had like experienced archers who've actually never shot ten meters. So, but they, they start at ten meters, um, but they've never shot ten meters bare bow, so they're using sights. So at ten meters, sights are very easy to line up. You just go bing, sight straight ahead and let go. But when you take the sights off, let me take this off. Sorry, when you take the uh, the sights off, um, one of the funny things you get you um, you get is that um, people don't realize how far lower they have to go when shooting bare bow. So I've seen a lot of people um, draw and try to shoot bare bow, but they're aiming so high because they're using the point of the arrow now, they're, they're actually pointing at the ceiling and they don't realize it. Um, there was one person who did shoot a hole in the wall and she never shot again um, indoors in that place. We had one more who I, I just stopped because she had a carbon arrow um, and she was, she decided to, because she, she came very late, she wanted to do at least one shot. So she didn't put her sight on, she shot bare bow have, despite having never shot a bare bow. Um, and she was going to, she's going to let go. And I turned around and went, wait, wait, stop, 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 stop. I just went, no, stop. Uh, so it was, uh, it was, these weren't dangerous things, but people don't realize, uh, how far off you have to be. The problem then is that because it's a shed, it's a tin shed, basically, it's a very loud noise when you miss. Very, very loud. So it's not so much, um, that... It's uh, danger or like that could go wrong, but it sounds awful. That's what puts people off a lot when they miss indoors. Um, but for the large part, um, I haven't really encountered any really dangerous situations. Um, have I won any competitions myself? Uh, club ones, yes. Uh, outside the club, no. Uh, I don't really shoot regularly enough and train serious enough to uh, be competitive. So, no, nah, I'm not. I probably should train more and try, but at the moment, no. Uh, other questions from chat here. Uh, Jitten, speak about Japan. Can you tell if historical Yumi was a heavy bow and not like the ones used for Kudo? Okay, the, the, the difficulty with this is that there, I don't think there are any sources which talk about um, Japanese archery prior to um, modern Kudo. Uh, I mean, Japanese archeries, as far, uh, archers, as far as I know, didn't measure draw weight. I mean, draw weight is kind of a modern thing. Like back then, they didn't measure draw weight using a, 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 um, a scale, for example. So uh, it's hard to estimate what the draw weights probably were. I mean, we have like the English longbows, which have tested to be like um, in uh, in the 100 to 150 pound range. So we have some evidence of that. Uh, other bows from historical time periods, the sources don't normally evaluate. Um, we don't normally evaluate things. So it's kind of hard to say how heavy the Yumi was, for example. Uh, modern Yumi tend to be, what, 40 pounds at full draw? Um, whereas historical war bows probably would have been um, a lot heavier for the sake of war. Because 40 pounds isn't much. You can't, you can't really kill in 40 pounds. So, yeah, that's kind of what I would imagine the case to be. I, I can't tell how heavy things were. And there's no real source which... Uh, elaborates on what weight the Japanese shot during the use of the uh, um, the, uh, the Yumi. Um, on, let me refresh my chat screen. I've got the chat on thing. Okay, got it now. Um, da -ba -bum, there was a. So, da -da -da -da. 
Um, mm -hmm. uh, Raphael, are dampers important or stabilizers? Dampers, are, the only role of dampers is to reduce vibration. So they help. They're not important, but they help. Let's see. What is my opinion on Greek and Roman bows? Isn't historically, I don't have an opinion. <laughs> um, they were used. Uh, uh, I don't. I don't think about. It. It's kind of like a, what's your opinion on Yumi? It, it's a Yumi. It's a bow. It's a Japanese bow. Well, why? Why would I have an opinion on it? I don't know. Like people have a lot of sentimental um, attachment to historical things, and they kind of romanticize and idolize the historical archery. So you have like the English longbow, which is majestic, and uh, you have the Yumi, which is epic, or the katana, which is legendary, or whatever. Uh, I don't. I don't really care about like you know piece of equipment i care about how they use and how people train to use them not so much the tool itself so people ask me well, what's your opinion on hunting bows or chinese bows it's a, it's a bow i mean if you make it look pretty you can paint it i don't care so i don't really have an opinion on roman bows or greek bows <laughs> um, otherwise what opinion would i have uh, they work um damaha uh is a shot it's a shot at a target from 40 meters can stick at long range. 40 meters is short range. Um, the long range is what, 70 meters. Um, anything below 70 meters is short range. Uh, jazz and tapioca. I always get anxious that I'm doing something wrong. How do you cope with anxiety? Uh, blind bell shooting. Um, I'm going to make a video. I've got a video lined up on the schedule to be released about target panic. Um, but the main thing is focus on process, not result. Uh, being target fixated and trying to shoot a small target or a bullseye or worrying about a score will lead to target panic and that can amp up your anxiety. So what you should do is take the um, target away from the process and focus only on process. Focus on the feeling of the shot, not the result of the shot. That's my best advice. Don't worry about doing things wrong. Shoot at close range close your eyes or you know have a target and open your eyes but go from a very very close distance where it's a, a comfort zone and just feel the shot don't worry about the result that's my, my general advice but Raphael do I still have my CX2 yes I do it's a paperweight right now um, Ian I've noticed how much bad shots tend to follow a pattern is there a recognized way to determine faults yes there is um, I've, I, I think I, someone asked me this question. I, I, I'm, well, it could be you. Um, target um, archery mistakes. There, there's a um, there's an actual diagram which uh, shows us. That I've mentioned this a few times. So, uh, search up target archery mistakes. You'll find this. That is um, what you're looking for, Ian. So um, just like search up this. Uh, target archery mistakes or diagram or something you get this that's that basically summarizes what 90% of the problems you get on target okay so that's what you will need to look at um, Eli how do I figure out when to increase my draw weight the first question is why do you need to increase your draw weight okay the question is when do I need to? What the, the more the question is why do you need to? That that's probably the best way to um to phrase it. So don't ask when you need to. Ask why you need to. If you if you need the both for hunting, sure it's fine. If you need the both to have a better performance at long distance, you don't need that. Um, basically, if you feel that shooting is nearly effortless, then you're fine you're completely fine you don't really need to um worry about uh you know you uh using a heavy drawer unless you really want to and you don't really need um to uh really push yourself it's more of a natural advancement so as you do more archery and you do it for months if you're comfortable then go up go up a few pounds that's completely fine but it's mostly can you actually handle it um whereas it's not not so much do you actually need it unless you're doing a particular reason um what else do we have here? Well, we'll jump to the prepare questions a bit. We've got a few more uh, stuff here. 
Gabrielle, is the measure of a human wingspan divided by 2.5 the estimated draw length precise enough? No, it's not. Um, that method is only an estimate. The only way to measure a draw length is to actually use a bow and uh, measure yourself using a rod or a, an arrow. So you can't... Um, that is only meant to give you a, a rough range. People are, will vary and your former technique will vary and, and will change your draw length and your anchor point will change your draw length. Lots of things change your draw length. That's only meant to be an estimate. Okay. Uh, tell us a story about an awesome historical archer. Uh, I'll, I'll do some separate videos. Uh, I'll, I'll spotlight certain historical archers in videos. Um, there aren't many historical archers which are actually verifiable. Um, there are some interesting ones from Japan, some from China. Um, there's Mad Jack Churchill during World War II, the last confirmed kill uh, with a longbow uh, in modern warfare. Uh, but we'll save that for a different time. How does brace height change when you change your limb weight? The brace height shouldn't change if you change weight. It's more if you um, change your string when your string unravels, or you change your uh, riser length or your limb length. But um, you shouldn't need to change your brace height if your limbs change in weight. Pedro, who had the most interesting archery techniques historically? Ooh, the most interesting techniques. Uh, define interesting. Yeah, give me an example of interesting, okay? Um, it's hard to say if there's anything interesting. Because archery is actually pretty... I mean, there's a lot of variety and um, variation technique, but it's most of the same thing. Um, I guess that i mean what's most i don't really have the most fascinating perhaps it's more the step archers like the huns and the mongols where they would have multiple uh bows that's the thing so the technique isn't something special but it's more the um how they use everything together in the system so um you have uh for example uh the step archers who had a lighter bow for uh long distance shooting and you had a heavier bow for short distance shooting if I'm, i might have, might have the other way around because heavy bows are more efficient at short distance whereas light bows can fling an arrow much further away um, so having, like you see illustrations of um, uh, archers like one bow, it's actually unrealistic and uh, depending on the context, but you see some illustrations with step archers or horse archers with two bows. So one in a case or a quiver and a second one on the horse on the other side. So you have like dual wielding bows, but they use, they swap the bows out depending on what they need to do um, and when how they're fighting. Another fascinating thing, talk about some historical archery. Um, there's a battle, I can't, I don't have the source with me right now do i no i don't so don't do the source with me all my books are like there at the moment but um there's a, a battle uh in the uh during the wars with the roses where the two english sides were fighting each other so both sides had longbows and um the english archers use light arrows for long distance shooting and heavy arrows for short distance shooting and with english archers on both sides, the f uh, they knew what the arrows were. So it was during a snowstorm, they couldn't see each other. Um, one side shot arrows uh, with the wind. So they shot the heavy arrows, I believe. Um, or was it light arrows? No, they used the heavy arrows into the wind. and Sorry, uh, with the wind. So the wind carried the arrows further than what they normally would um, and the other side saw the heavy arrows fall uh, in their area so because they couldn't see the opposing archer line they assumed that they were using um, they were within range because they were using the short range arrows but the wind the blizzard was carrying them further uh, further uh, towards their lines so they shot um, their own heavy arrows in return but they all fell short because they were out of range. Um, so that was a little bit interesting strategy there. Um, and the, the uh, army, of course, um, they, they saw the arrows, they shot their other arrows and hit them. They picked up their, the, the arrows they shot from the other side and shot them back because they were in range, whereas the other side wasn't. Um, a little clever there. Uh, that's really interesting. Um, 
so yeah, uh, I'll I'll be more specific with the source, and I'll I'll do more history videos in the uh, days to come or the weeks to come. So I'll think about that in a, a bit later. But some interesting stuff there, lots of interesting things. Um, Drawed, what's special about Cretan archers? Um, I've read a theory that they weren't special because bows were used everywhere in Greece, just not in warfare. Um, I guess with Cretan archers, uh, from what I've heard, the terrain in Crete, which is not much different from the rest of Greece apparently, um, but the Cretans um, actually specialised in bows. So that's why um, that's why the Cretan archers were sought after. There were archers everywhere in Greece, but no, um, no city-state kind of maintained a large number of archers. So they were often recruited from elsewhere. So the Spartans um, were often recruited from the Cretans. And you know every um, you know uh, army afterwards knew about the Cretan reputation and they hired them. Um, so the Cretan archers weren't necessarily special in any way, but they had archers, and that's kind of what made them special because most of Greece didn't use archers in their armies. They were very very um, lightly used skirmishers, if, if at all. Um, so that's why they were special. Adam, why didn't or did the Roman army use archers? I've never heard much about that. Um, it is mostly because of the style of warfare at the time. So remember, archery would require a lot of resources. It's a very specialized uh, field of war. You have hunters, but hunters aren't soldiers. So that's not exactly the same thing. But for the Romans, their modus operandi was heavy infantry. That was always their style of warfare. They would have infantry. And especially when we get towards the Republic era and the, um, em the uh, Empire, um, it was always the legionary. Um, that was always their go-to. Um, they didn't have much cavalry. Um, cavalry was a prestigious thing. Um, and archers were, well, they didn't have archers. So as a culture um, or as a uh, method of war, uh, the Romans inherited a lot from the Greeks in terms of the phalanx warfare. Um, and they would later adopt from the Etruscan uh, neighbours, and they fought in a much smaller flexible formation, the Manipal, um style of warfare. But that was all based on infantry. So uh, archery was never really practical on a large scale as, as required by the military. Um, the Romans would hire mercenaries or hire auxiliary forces for their cavalry and their archers, but the Romans themselves wouldn't employ archers because that's not what they're trained the army to do. Their style of warfare was basically get a lot of citizen soldiers with uh, spears and shields because remember that before the uh, Marian reforms uh, each soldier had to pay their own way so instead of buying bows and arrows and training how to use them they would buy a shield and their um, their, their mail shirts um, and their sword and that's how they fought. Um, but yeah that's, that's kind of why you don't see Roman archers because they weren't actually um, they didn't really feel a key role in the Roman style of warfare. So it supplemented the Roman army, but didn't replace the Roman army. And we didn't really see like really large formations of archers until the medieval ages. Uh, and talk about really large formations, like the English, for example. Like uh, at Asian Corps, they probably had what 7,000 archers out of like 9,000 men on the field. So they were like, you know, Age of Empires 2 style, you spam longbowmen and they win wars that way. That's kind of what, how it worked. Why did I start archery? I'm pretty sure I asked me this question. Like maybe you asked me this question a while ago, um, because someone got me into it. It was a random thing. Um, I, it was a day out. Friend said, "Try the archery club next to your workplace." We did. I liked it. Uh, I didn't have a, a a disposition towards archery before that, or any sport before that. Um, is it practical, uh, Excellentia? Uh, is it practical to wear a bow on your back like in video games? Uh, you can wear it on your back. Is it practical? Not really. Um, firstly, depending on the size of the bow, it can be very uncomfortable. Um, the brace has a big part there. So a horse bow might be a bit more comfortable, um, but a long bow would be very uncomfortable because there's a lot of pressure on your chest, squeezing. It's kind of uncomfortable. Um, and the fact that you have a very long, um, a very long bow uh, makes it difficult um, to kind of walk around. So it can be done, but it's kind of impractical. The second thing is that it actually 
damages the bow or the bow string, especially if wearing armor. Because if you're wearing armor, there are many surfaces which can be quite abrasive. Um, so if your string catches on something on your chest, for example, that can damage the string. That's probably the main reason why you don't normally see people historically wear bows slung over the back. It it is, in my opinion, the the equivalent to wearing a sword on your back. It looks good on screen probably not practical in real life. In real life, archers would most likely um, either carry the bow in their hand, uh, on a carriage or on their horse, or um, for the uh, step archers, because you're using shorter bows, they'll carry the bow in its own quiver. So you wouldn't really see people wear the bow around them. Um, that, that, that's as far as I know. It can be done, just not a very um, not as convenient as you think it is. Um, let's see. Do I have any armor? No. When will this upload it? This will be, um, this is automatically on the channel. So it's a live stream. You'll get the video on demand as soon as the stream is finished. Do I think speed shooting was a real thing back then? Um, I'll do a special video on this later, but in quickly my opinion. Um, yes. But not for the reason people think it was. People think that speed shooting uh, does. Uh, when people think speed shooting is for close quarters rapid fire, that's not what archers were used for. No source verifies archers in close quarters combat, and every source implies that archers are meant to not fight in close quarters. Um, speed shooting is more a matter of convenience. So the fact that you're holding multiple arrows in your hand, for example, um, don't have a bow to show you, but if you're holding many arrows in your string hand, it isn't to shoot faster, but it's meant to remove the awkwardness of pulling arrows from a, from an arrow bag, for example, because you might not have the chance to reach behind you, or you might be on a horse, you have to like reach down to your side. So things might be a little different, but um, speed shooting probably was not a, a a common technique used in battle. Probably meant to improve skill. So someone who can shoot quickly is probably going to shoot normally, uh, but more efficiently. But I don't think it will be a combat technique. Couple of reasons. The first one is how much ammunition you have. Um, the average archer probably carried no more than 40 arrows, depending on the size of the quiver and what else they carry. So now, some historical archers might carry up to 100 arrows, for example. You have multiple quivers, but a single quiver doesn't carry that many arrows. Um, there might be 25 to 40, depending on the size and the number of quivers they carry. But typically, you might expect no more than 50 arrows on a person. So if you're shooting like multiple arrows in quick succession, like pow, pew, 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 you're out of ammunition like before the battle even starts. So that's why I doubt speed shooting was a common technique. Uh, in addition, it's much more on the function and the context of the battle more so than the speed. Um, another argument people put forward is that uh, archers must have, like if you're shooting a long distance at a formation, they shot really quickly because you didn't have to aim. That's bullcrap. Uh, that's actually one of the biggest myths and the most unsubstantiated myths I've ever seen because at long distance, it's more important to aim. I mean, have you ever heard of someone saying, oh, they're too far away. I don't have to aim. That's stupid. You can imagine like a modern rifleman using a a, 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 a modern assault rifle thinking, oh, he's past 300 meters, therefore I'm going to spray and pray. That doesn't make any sense. But you, you remember, like the whole point is that you have elite archers who've trained for years. They know how to use heavy war bows. They know how to range their targets, right? So why would you tell your elite archers you can hit a target within like 150 meters, fairly close, you know, to that particular spot, and tell them to not aim but they shoot very quickly? If all you need is speed, you don't need elite trained archers. All right, you just get you give bows to your peasants and tell them to spam arrows. So that's why I I don't think speed shooting was the norm. I'm not saying it couldn't be done or wasn't done, but it wouldn't be the norm for uh, warfare. It would have been much more paced out and sustained because accuracy and power were just as important. And the same sources which support speed shooting also put up accuracy and power in the same pillars of archery. 
So that's why I don't think spirit shooting was that important in historical time periods. Phew. All right. Um, what do I think of Lindy Beige and his archery videos? Um, Lindy Beige, he is generally quite good with his archery videos. Um, he ha he's done a, he's done a one on ballistics, he's done a one on fire arrows. He's also done the crap archery hell of Troy. Um, it's mostly his mannerisms which are appealing, but to me, I find them a little less appealing. I enjoyed them first time around, but I don't enjoy his commentary and mannerisms. But that's just a personal thing. His content's usually quite good. Um, and it's just that for me, I prefer to get straight to the point. So I'm, I'm the polar opposite of the, the style there. Um, but otherwise, his content's pretty good. Nothing to disagree with. Um, so he's quite good at analyzing the archery used. Um, Jacques, it's been a while since I built the Python. How would you compare it to Windows CXD? The Python is a solid high performance aluminium riser. The CXD is a solid high performance carbon riser. They're pretty good equally. I just like the Python a bit more because it's a bit heavier. The CXD is a bit lighter, a bit more delicate. Otherwise, they're pretty good. I haven't seen a shot IQ video shooting modern bows for thumb draw. Uh, can you can you link the video space? I don't have time to search it, but I'm I'm curious about that. Um, my opinion hasn't changed, but I haven't seen the video yet. Daniel, do I think archers were considered less honourable than say a rank and file foot soldier, much in the modern snipers, much aligned? Ye oh, yes, but not for the same reason. Um, the modern day sniper carries a bit of a black reputation since World War I, um, since uh, it's mostly you're shooting at someone at a distance you can't shoot back. Um, but that's warfare for you. Um, archery has that similar reputation uh, historically because real combat was man to man, not um, how uh, shooting someone from a, from a bush or something from a tree. So that's dishonorable. And generally speaking, the army valued, you know, in terms of honor, archers were generally disliked. But and the more you went to the crossbow rifle era, the more it got like dishonorable. But it they had a very important function in war. It depends on your culture as well. Um, but yeah, it's kind of like the whole masculine, like a uh, man-to-man -man fight in single combat sort of thing versus shot from a random arrow. That's probably where it comes from. But again, we know that you know the idea of chivalry or honor is very much romanticized and exaggerated. Um, lords, knights, um, samurai, and shogun, and whatever they were, many of them were just as scrupulous as everyone else. They were very happy to shoot someone with an arrow. Uh, so that's kind of where it comes from. Um, so they were probably seen as a lower class compared to um, actual men at arms and knights, but higher than a regular foot soldier. But people hated being shot at. They liked having archers on their side, but not having archers on the enemy side. Um, Keith, to be fair, Tolkien was responsible for many of the fantasy archetypes today. Um, elves being, um, you know, forest creatures, dwarves being things. I mean, he didn't invent elves, he didn't invent dwarves, but he invented the genre. And a lot of subsequent fantasy uh, worlds would draw upon the Lord of the Rings, because he wrote this in the 1940s. And it's been a very huge uh, legendarium since. Now again, he didn't invent um, these uh, tribes, but he was one. He he popularized them through his writing, um, and we owe a lot to Tolkien and the Lord of the Rings legendarium um, for many of the archetypes we see today. Um, draw. What is the advantage of using archers compared to slingers? Um, Slingers generally have more range, yes, that that's one thing. Um, and they can use you know, more ammunition, so lead bullets, or they can use stones. Um, archery, the reason why archery is the became the preferred um, missile weapon in historical eras was because it was just simply the more accurate um, weapon. Um, yes, a sling could outrange uh, an archer. But an archer had far more control on where the missile went. 
um, before the shot. That that's why they were dominant. Not because of, I mean later on archers would outrange uh, slingers, but the early archers would be outranged by slingers. But slingers, they didn't do as much damage. There's more blunt damage. So you could definitely crack a skull if you hit the skull. Um, but an archer could aim. Okay, okay, that's just the main difference. I'm just trying to recall the source material. The main distinction with a bow is that the bow can be aimed, and a slinger can't aim their weapon. They can. It's instinctive. They they can they can throw. Uh, they can sling much further, but they couldn't aim there at all. Okay, you have like the javelin. You have the you have like the dart. You have the, the the sling, and you have the bow. The bow has the it's the best compromise between distance and accuracy. That's that's why the bow was the most popular weapon during um, historical warfare, because you could aim it. Uh, in the history of war, is one arrow enough to instant kill Mandarin war? No. No. Unless it was a very unusual shot through the eyeball, um, an arrow would never instant kill. Unless you were shot in the eye. Even then, that wasn't guaranteed. So you really had to go through the eye socket into the brain for instant kill. Um, you could bleed out, but most arrow wounds weren't deadly. Arrows aren't really lethal, despite what games might tell you. Like, in games, if an arrow, like, touches your forearm, you die. <laughs> this is Far Cry logic, but in, uh, in real life, it wouldn't insta-kill. Uh, Edwin, the person who helped me set up my bow, suggested shooting with the index feather inwards. That's That goes against most advice. Um, when you're shooting feathers, it doesn't matter as much, actually, because feathers will um, fold when it crosses the, um, the riser. But in most cases, you would never shoot the index finger on the inside. The whole point of the index finger is to point the index feather is to point outwards to avoid um, to improve clearance. So the guy is telling you to shoot the feather inwards. It's giving you really, really bad advice. All right, I think we've cleared most of the chat questions. Phew, let's go back to some of our prep questions. Um, so. Um, Tracy asks, how is accuracy affected by windage over distance? Um, a lot. Um, archers hate wind. Uh, a competitive archer really, really hate wind. Um, they hate wind. A slight breeze can blow your arrow one or two colors at 70 meters. So, um, depends on your arrow, depends on your draw weight, but a slight breeze can completely shift your arrow through a whole um, section on the target. So, it is quite important. Have I tried LARP archery? No, I haven't. Not really interested. I don't have a group near me which actually does it. The other thing with LARP is that the people who do LARP are very peculiar people. Not in a bad way, but they do it for a particular reason. Um, whereas the people, like, and LARP archers are more into it for the role playing and the fun of shooting people with a bow and arrow. Um, I'm not interested in that role playing thing. Um, am I interested in reenactment? No, because I don't live in a place which has a large reenactment culture. I mean, why would Australia uh, reenact medieval warfare? That'd be really cool, but things like Renaissance fairs, we don't really have here. Um, so, yeah, I really haven't really tried it, not really interested in it. I'll watch the Shot IQ video in a bit. Um, windage is quite important. Uh, Rich Lupo, here's a good question. Um, procedure at World Archery Sanctioned Competitions. The caller points and announces each arrow's score. If the caller sees a very close liner, what is the proper procedure for summoning a judge? Does the caller need to call the lower score first, which is then challenged by the archer and the judge is called? Can only the archer shot the arrow challenge? Okay, scoring is quite straightforward. So scoring is done by the scorer on target. Now, if you're doing a normal event, you do it yourself. Now, at World Archery events, um, the archer has to stay at the shooting line, so it's the, the team that does the scoring. Now, if there's a line call, the score isn't recorded until the judge determines what the score is. So you don't record and then challenge because they can't challenge it, they can't see it. So if there's any uncertainty, um, then they call the judge. And for WA events, the judge is already there anyway. Um, so the judge uh, will, if they'll know if it's close. If it's one on one, they'll know if it's close. They'll verify it. But you know, in any competition, if there's any uncertainty, 
you call the judge and the judge will decide. You don't call it yourself and then call it a judge. So if you're, if you're sharing a target, you go, that's really close. What do you think? Not sure. Judge. Judge. And then the judge will come over. Use the, you know, if they, if they have to, use the magnifying lens and close it in there. Um, but uh, it's it's not a matter of challenge. It's not like uh, you know in um, cricket how you can use the uh, decision review system to uh, you know call a review and do a slow motion shot where it lands. Um, it's mostly judges already there. Judge help us out. What do you think? And they'll say, oh, that's a uh, a one, <laughs> not a two. Um, that's how it works. Uh, and we'll finish the Facebook questions. We'll fly through the uh, YouTube ones in a bit. Uh, I'll do the live ones in a moment. Uh, last question: What alternative target shooting? Um, in terms of archery, it will be clout. In terms of alternative, the most common alternate archery competition is clout. That's a long distance shooting. Comes from a very historical root. Um, there are other alternative target shooting, but that's the main one which um, people do outside of field 3D uh, and target shooting. Um, chat questions. What do we have here? Um, I haven't used BCY X99. Uh, archery YouTube channels, especially bare bow, not really, because most YouTube channels are, are, are either compound, compound bow hunting, or trad recurve. You don't really find a lot of uh, bare bow specific channels. I don't really have a source for that, unfortunately. I don't really have a favorite arrow point. <laughs> They're tools. Morphe is good, but it's more he's more trad. Like we don't really have modern recurve, uh, a modern bare bow recurve as much. Okay, let's go to our next set. Um, from YouTube, what do I enjoy? What, what do I enjoy shooting more? If you use one for the rest of your life, uh, traditional definitely. Um, Olympic, I do for the challenge and for the competition. If I didn't compete, I wouldn't use Olympic. There's no point because it it's made for a singular purpose for competition. Traditional is what archery was, and whether you're using a modern. Traditional bow or using um, any bow, traditional is what archery is. Olympic is a very specific purpose. It's like if if you were to drive, um, like it's, it's asking like, would you drive a Formula One car on the street? No, you, no, you wouldn't. It's meant it's purpose made and not street legal, but it's purpose made for a racetrack. And an Olympic recurve bow is purpose made for Olympic recurve competition. So you wouldn't really need to use it uh, outside of Olympic recurve competition. So I'd much rather shoot trad. In fact, I prefer trad in general. So that, you know, I wouldn't shoot uh, anything else. Uh, Adam, do you have any preferred movie art just for considering technique? Um, Meridia from Brave. Uh, she's by far the most accurate depiction of archery. Um, in, in the whole film is, but her technique is the best um, technique in archery. The problem, uh, Legolas is mostly CG. Katniss uh, Everdeen's problem with archery is that she's trained by an Olympic archer, but she's a bow hunter. Um, that's the wrong um, te- I mean, it's good technique, but it's the wrong technique for what she does. Um, and it's it's less apparent in the later films. It's less less important. But um, Meridia from uh, Brave is the best archer for technique and reference. In fact, you can actually learn how to shoot by watching Brave, because all the mistakes are correctly depicted, and the correct technique is correctly shown in Brave. Uh, as far as I know, no other movie actually goes to the extent of showing correct technique. Um, most movies um, show uh, very uh, exaggerated or fantastical versions of archery. Even War of the Arrows, which people love, it's very much fantastical. Um, mm. Apart from the Tong Ah, uh, ironically, the Tong Ah, which is like, it looks like the most ridiculous device, is the most accurate thing in the movie. Everything else is completely fantastical. Good example, arrows can't go through people. Okay, that, that's one trope I'll address some point. Remember, if you're going through a person, firstly, you go through their armor. So what clothing they have, you have their mail shirt or their hauberk or um, their plate, whatever. And then you have the um, gambeson or the padded armor beneath that. Then their body, past their bones and flesh and organs, through another layer of 
fabric armor, then through another layer of chain mail, and then it goes even through that. And if it's a second person, same thing, you go through their chain mail. Like, it, it, it's like how you see people stab through someone and the sword comes out the other side. That's what's very fantastical. Arrows don't do that, no matter how fast, how good they are, they, they can't actually do that. So, yeah, in terms of the most um, the best technique, and just in general, the best depiction of archery, the answer is Brave. Hands down, Brave is the best um, reference for archery, to the point where people can and do learn to shoot from Brave. No other film can actually teach you to shoot. Brave by itself can. If you copy Meridia, oh, what's her name? Uh, Marina Meridia, if you copy her, you will shoot well. That's that. That's the praise I give to the movie. If you just watch her and copy her, you will shoot well. No other movie can do this. All right. Uh, back to our questions. Um, how does one engage the back muscles properly while shooting NTS? Um, by uh, the, the key was is expansion. Um, there's no. I, I can't show you. I need to. You need a coach to walk you through this. I can't teach you through the internet without actually having you in front of me. The key from what Keith Glee says, is that it's an internal movement. It's not meant to be, stretch out. You're at full draw, and there's a slight internal movement in between your shoulder blades. It is nearly imperceptible from an external perspective. A coach can see what you're doing, but a normal person can't see that movement. When you watch all the pro archers at the World Cup, the shooting, there's hardly any movement between full draw and clicker. There's hardly any movement. That's how you correctly use the clicker and use back tension in archery. And NTS specifically teaches this. I'm going to disagree with one thing, Daniel. It's the way you use the archer's paradox. It shows the arrow oscillation. It doesn't show the archer's paradox. That's the upcoming video, by the way. I haven't finished doing it yet, but it doesn't show Archer's Paradox, it shows uh, the, uh, the arrow oscillation. And in case you're wondering why I'm picking this out, the arrow flex or the arrow oscillation is not the Archer's Paradox. It's one of the uh, pet peeves. There are two P's which Archer's hate. One is firing arrows. The second one is Archer's Paradox because people don't know what it means and they say it like it means something and actually it doesn't. Uh, next question. Um, ah, Constantine, shooting multiple arrows at once. How does it connect with reality? What stops Arch from doing this? Uh, and if you make it work, how do you adapt your technique? Now, people can do this. Um, the main limitation of the multi-arrow shot, the multi-shot, is that um, you lose power um, because you divide the energy from your shot equally between each arrow. So you can shoot two arrows at once, but each arrow only has half the power of, the, of one arrow. Um, if you have like three or four arrows, I mean, people can do this. There are videos which, where people can shoot like eight arrows at once and it, they, they hit the target, but they hit the target with so little energy, half of them bounce off. So you can't aim multiple arrows. It's a waste of multiple arrows and each arrow is ridiculously weak compared to having just one arrow. That's why you don't see it. Can you use field quivers for target archery? Yes, of course you can. Most people do. Um, I'm mean, not the most, but a lot of people use field quivers because field quivers are the same as target quivers, it's that they just face the other way. The only um, disadvantage would be that you can't really see your arrow because the, uh, having the forward facing hip quiver means you can see all your arrows in front of you. So, should you inspect something or look at uh, how many arrows you have left, for example, you can see in front of you and, man and manipulate things in front of you. Another slight advantage is that most um, hip quivers have a side pouch on it, whereas the field quivers, by the design, don't have a hip pouch. Though you can buy separate um, release pouches. Again, not everyone uses it, so it doesn't really matter, um, but I find that hip quivers tend to be more spacious, whereas field quivers tend to have less compartments. Apart from that, it's the same thing. Uh, there's no um, reason why you can't use one. All right, next. <coughs> Sorry, it's gonna get a bit of a drink here. Mm. Uh, Rimothy, bow fishing. I have no thoughts on bow fishing. Uh, it's actually illegal where I am, so I can't bow fish. But like with most things, like I, I, I don't have an opinion on things I don't do. 
Um, it's it's. Uh, I, I'm just bring a quick commentary here. People keep asking, you know, what what's your opinion on bows? What's your opinion on English bowmen? What's your opinion on bow hunting or bow fishing? If I don't think about it, I have no opinion about it, and I'm not I'm not the sort of person who has an opinion for the sake of having an opinion. If I have an opinion, I'll care about it, but I don't really have an opinion uh, on things I don't do. So bow fishing, I don't do it. I don't care about it. No opinion. I, I don't quite agree, Space Jockey, I'm just reading here. So, given an arrow versus set slot of center for a right-hand bow, the arrow's oscillation does bend around the wrist. No, no, the, the archer's paradox, by definition, refers to before the arrow is shot, not what the arrow does. The fact that the arrow does bend is a, a result of the paradox, but it's not the paradox itself. So, you can't describe the oscillation as the paradox. That's not what the paradox is. There's nothing paradoxical about a flexing arrow, an arrow flexes, that's, that's a fact, it's not a paradox. The paradox refers to the direction the arrow is pointing at at rest compared to at full draw. Because the paradox states that the arrow would seemingly have to pass through the point of origin at full draw. So there's a deflection in place there. So it, it is not the oscillation, that's why you can't call it a paradox. The oscillation is the oscillation. The paradox is a visual misperception because it, it defies logic because you can't shoot straight through a bow unless you've got a center shot bow. Um, but the paradox does not refer to the flex of the oscillation. It doesn't matter what the arrow does. The paradox is not the flex of the arrow. Um, I'll do a video of that. I've got a video coming up about that specifically. But that's the most, it's the most misunderstood term in, term in archery, the archer's paradox. Because people see like slow motion videos of the flexing arrow and think, ah, paradox. That's not the paradox is. And the problem is that most archers shoot modern bows with cutouts. So they think that flexing means uh, paradox. But that's actually not what it means. Um, what is the best bow for a beginner? There is no best bow for a beginner. Uh, the one you can afford, the one you like. Uh, next question: Can you shoot an explosive modificated arrow? Modif modificated arrow? Um, that that's fantasy. I mean, like you, you could put uh, you could put a time delay fuse or an impact fuse on the arrow point, but the problem is that most explosives are too heavy. So it's like a fire arrow. You wouldn't use it for long distance shooting, and you can't do much with it. It's very much a fantasy thing. I do not think that explosive arrows have ever been used anywhere so this is purely fantastical and hypothetical you could you could put an impact fuse or a time fuse on anything it, you call it a grenade <laughs> okay so could you stick something on a bow and shoot it yes you could would it go very far not necessarily would it be very useful no yeah so space you're right that, that's what the paradox is So I'm not sure what we're disagreeing on, to be honest there, but that's what the paradox is. But it doesn't mean the bend around the arrow, it just means the arrow is pointing off-center. There is a very slight offset for most bows, yes. Uh, but it's mostly um, mitigated by uh, by a center shot. Um, the, arrow, the arrow is to oscillate because the string is displaces from the fingers unevenly, because there's a, you know, obviously uh, handed for a reason, right-handed, left-handed. So the arrow is to oscillate. Um, but it's not the same thing as the flex. So what um, Jake is saying, the arrow oscillator, let me show you. You know what, uh, I've got a video in production, so you see this later on, but short version is, this is oscillation. Arrow flex is flex. The paradox, let's say my hand is here, the bow is here, right? At rest, I can't do this properly, so I put the camera in the way, at rest I'm pointing, um, if I'm pointing my bow straight at the target, the arrow is off center, and that's at full draw. Okay, so the arrow is pointed one way at rest. When I pull the full draw, it comes on target. That's the paradox in in a nutshell. So at brace, I'm shooting. I'm aiming my bow at the target, and the arrow is pointing off target. At full draw, I'm I'm on target. That's that's the artist's paradox. It's not the flex. The flex happens because it has to deflect around the riser. Um, that's why it happens. But the paradox itself is not the flex. The paradox is this difference where to be, when I'm pointing on target, 
the arrow is pointing away from target. That's the paradox. And while people didn't know about it, they knew about it. Um, it's just that they didn't understand how the arrow got past the rods until we had slow motion cameras. Hmm. Uh, do I have specific dedicated gear for Tudor to try? Um, now I do. Basically, all the bows I read, I still have, right? So I've got a bunch of different bows. I normally leave them in the club. Um, so I've got like the hunting bows. I've got the um, the the Chinese bows. They're all there, so people can try different bows. The main reason is people want to buy a bow, and the first thing they show me is um, <laughs> they show me uh, an Optimo or they show me. Uh, a Samic Polaris, and I've got one already, so they can use that. So I've, I've got like a sample platter of bows at the club, which I normally give to people to try. Uh, if you send me a picture of your target, can I tell you what your form is? No. I can um, deduce certain things, but I can't reverse engineer your form. Um, <laughs> I, I can do possibilities, but you know the, the 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 errors on target are fairly similar no matter who does it. There's nothing special about one target versus another. Most things can be diagnosed. What Ian asked earlier is that diagram we had, which I still have here. Basically, I could probably tell you what's happening using just this diagram alone, um, but there's nothing much beyond that. Um, back to our YouTube questions, just a few more here. Um, what are some muscle workouts? I would I use strength my back. Um, SPTs. Look up S archery SPT or specific physical training. Um, I've got a video on that already. That's the best um workout for w strengthening your back muscles. Full stop. You can gym as well if you want to, but that's the best exercise. It's designed specifically for archers. So do look at SPTs. Um, Joseph, I read a uh, regular indoor recap, which is 10 by 6 arrows at first, and elimination at 6 by 6. Um, 20 seconds per arrow, I believe. Uh, how much uh, time do you have between rounds and ends? Um, as much as it takes to recover the arrows. I don't know how long the whole competition lasts. Um, Dominic, was I upset when Negan killed my character? I don't watch Walking Dead, so I'm not sure my, who my character is. Um, Sam, do I have any tips on using a clicker? No. Garlic, have you done archery with 3 targets? Uh, no, I haven't. Ale, is there any gym assistance workout? SPTs. You don't need to do workouts in the gym to uh, do high level archery. You can if you want to. I'll say this a lot, okay? So there are, there are workouts. I'm not the best person to ask, but um, yeah, Hoyt Archery has a few different workouts. You can do exercise if you want to. That can supplement your training, but you don't need to. So you, you can reach high level without doing any gym training. Um, again, main thing is you need to do it regularly, and SPTs can help a lot. Again, SPTs were designed specifically to train artery muscles. Uh, do I keep spare arm guards? No, I don't, because I have a club. I've got like you know a hundred arm guards in tab. So why do I need my own stuff? So this is a bit different, right? So, no, I don't have a spare, I have spare bows. I've got plenty of excess equipment, like quivers and uh, gloves and thumb rings and all of that because I review things. I've got a lot of surplus equipment which I can loan out and people who join the club, I'll loan them my own bow because I've got so, I don't care about it, I've got so many. I'll loan them a bow, they can use that until they buy their own bow. That's why I tell people, just just do it. Just, just don't, don't waste money on crap kit. But remember, I have an archery club. So that's how people try bows. They go to my archery club. Not for me personally, the club. Um, next question from the list here. Um, is pounds and bow can be increased, decreased? Um, no. You can't change the poundage of a set of limbs. Now, if you're using a, a riser with tiller bolts, so you have um, the IOF bolts or any um, screw you can tighten or loosen, um, you can adjust um, the draw weight from the riser within a given percentage, normally 10% total. But you can't change the draw weight of the limb itself. Uh, next question. Um, should I get from Jack Frosty? Uh, sorry, sup, I'm Zaz. If not archery, but other sports, what do I have practiced? 
uh, and dedicate to that's that's hard to quit hard because I, I I didn't like sports. Um, if I was to do a sport, it'll probably be a more stereotypical Asian sport like badminton or table tennis. Um, that's probably what I would do um, rather than archery. I have played uh, soccer, but never got into it. Not really a physical running around person. But probably badminton or table tennis. Just Jack Frosty. Should I get new arrows as an increase in poundage? The answer is yes. Um, if you're changing your draw weight, then you no longer have the right tune for your arrows. So yes, you will need to change your arrows if you want to shoot accurately. Uh, the gifts work. How can I see if my button's too stiff or good for my arrows? I'm shooting way too much on the left side. Then adjust your button. <laughs> if, if everything else is um, tuned and your arrows are going left, then adjust your button. Um, that's how you know. You soften the button until it comes back online. You've, you've answered your own question there, gifts work. So if you need to adjust your, your um, the, the tension on your spring, then that's what you do. Um, Trad by Rich by changing draw weight on an IFL riser, will that significantly change a point on? Answers yes, definitely. Even a slight change in draw weight, um, even a slight change in brace height will change your point on. Uh, significantly, I'm not sure significantly, but the answer is yes. And lastly, Peter, uh, do I still play War Thunder? No. I'll make a special video about that to announce my retirement specifically. Um, but uh, I don't play War Thunder. I don't intend to anymore. I've, I'm done. So um, that'll be a different announcement later on. But, you know, one thing at a time. Anyway, that concludes the um, prepared questions. This is now the open floor. So any questions you have, feel free to ask. Um, Jetan, your thoughts in Arabic archery book? What do I think about it? I, I don't know. Like, what do you want me to think about it? Like, I need a more specific question. People ask me, what's your opinion? What do you think? It's a book. It's interesting. It reflects a good historical um, insight into archery. What else can I think about it? Um, it is a product of its time. Uh, it It is an interesting... Um, it is an interesting text because the author is a critical writer. So the author doesn't just repeat information. The author also opines on what he thinks um, is right and wrong by comparing different archery masters and p proposing all the alternatives used at the time. Now, as a historical text, it is very valuable because it is one of the earliest comprehensive texts that actually teach someone how to do archery. Um, there are only like four texts which do this. One is Roger Asham's Toxophilus, there's Mamluk archery or Saracen archery, there's Arab archery, and there's one more I can't remember, uh, Horace Ford is the other, other one. Horace Ford came much later. So um, there aren't any texts that do before, this, before the 1500s which document these things um, to that detail. There are many texts which mention archery or chronicle archery, but you couldn't learn how to shoot from these texts alone. Toxophilus, to a lesser extent, does it. It's more of a conversation. You could learn to shoot, but it's written in a creative way. But um, Arab archery is probably going to be the... Well, it is probably the most comprehensive source that teaches proper archery, apart from Mamluk archery. Um, why did Eastern Horse Archer shoot from the right side and why did it use the thumb draw? The big question is which came first, the, uh, the chicken or the egg? So, here's the thing. So, um, there are many factors. One is that in many Eastern cultures, wood is scarcer. So, you couldn't use lots of wood to make lots of um, long wooden bows. So, there was more of a shift towards using shorter bows because wood was scarcer and there was more of a, um, a, a drive to use composite materials. So composite bows are mostly eastern bows because of combination factors. Less wood and the demand was to have more composite bows. And because the, but these bows tend to be very short, they are shot much more easily with one digit 
or one digit rather than three digits or two digits. Um, and because of that, the thumb draw came about. Now, some people think that the thumb draw, did the people use the thumb draw because of the bow? Or do people use the bow because of the thumb draw? It's most, from what I understand, it's actually the bow itself, which um, lends towards the thumb draw. And because people shoot with the thumb draw, um, if you shoot with the arrow on the left side, the arrow falls off because you're twisting the string the other way. So it's more prone to falling off. Uh, falling off. Um, whereas if you put the string on the right, uh, the arrow on the right side, the uh, index finger holds the arrow in place, allowing you to shoot it from different angles. So that's what I understand. By the way, yes, the egg came first. Uh, I'll talk about the um, the the other you know, uh, philosophical question, which people will parrot. But the eggs are first because egg-laying creatures predated chickens. That's the reason why the egg came first. Um, but yeah, same with the horse bows. People postulate chick uh, a chicken and egg, or is it thumb draw or horse bow? The bow was the, from what I understand, the bow it was what led to the D technique being used. Because the bow was shorter, it required only one digit to shoot compared to two or three, which is too hard on a very short bow. These bows are very short. Um, and because of the thumb draw technique, the right side of the arrow was used. Um, as bows became longer, um, talk about like some of the, uh, the Chinese bows and of course the Yumi, because the technique, um, because the bow was spread, by um, Eastern civilizations, it's very likely that they retained the technique even though the bow didn't need to be used in that manner. But regardless, that's that's the the path of evolution of the thumb draw and which side to use. Do I think it's possible to think too much? Of course it's possible to overthink things. Everyone goes through this. So, yes. Um... Yeah, um, that what you describe, Keith, is what every archer goes through. You're not meant to think about your process. You just do your process. And most of your errors come from overthinking. Um, Jetan, do I think it's do I think Arabic archery is fantasy? No, because it's very explicit on what is um, realistic and applicable and what stunt shooting and trick shooting. So it's not fantasy. All these all the things in the book can be done. The only thing from Arabic archery or Saracen archery that, that can't be proven is the three hours and one and a half seconds. Because that requires a certain technique which we don't know about. Uh, but everything in Saracen and Arab archery can be done. The Jamaki is well documented and done very widely by archers. Um, yep, yeah, all the techniques can be done. So it's not fantasy at all. It's just like, is it practical in real combat? The answer is probably not, but it can be definitely be done. Is it worth shooting in the rain? The only thing is, you know, like, do you enjoy shooting in the rain? If you don't, then don't bother. It doesn't really affect your shooting if just doing short range shooting. So that's your call. If it's worth it, up to you. If you want to shoot and you don't mind being wet, that's that's fine. <coughs> uh, Yami Yo, if you have a question, feel free to ask it. Wait, if, if it's unrelated to it, then ask the question anyway. That's why I'm here. Did I miss something? No, I didn't see that. Uh, uh, do I have a favorite bow? Not really. Um, but the pick one, it's kind of probably going to be the, at the moment, it's the, the bear takedown. But I've got more bows coming in, which I might like more. So, we'll see. Uh, I'm going to quickly check out the, um, this, the, uh, the IQ video. Um, do that's not what I wanted to see. Ah, right, the thumb draw video, right? Um, blah, 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 where is it? Ah, there we go. You've uh, you, you edited the video.
And that's, a, that's a fairly old video. The shot IQ. Yeah, let, 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 let's watch this together. So, not sure if it aged well, but this is a fairly old video. I just want to point out quickly, um, Space mentioned before that um, if, if you use your thumb draw along the string, then it doesn't fall off, the answer is yes. Um, that's what modern Mongolian art just do. The thing is that it's not a, a, a traditional historical Mongolian technique. That's a modern technique because of the influences of Western archery into Mongolia. So it can be shot without... Um, lifting the arrow off the string if you basically string walk with it it can be done but it's not done traditionally uh, back to the video sorry so what we're looking at here is he explaining something challenges that I wanted out of shooting with my fingers. I've got mental control of my shot now, so I can experiment with all kinds of different things. And I thought I'd try thumb shoot. So it took me a long time to figure it out. There's lots of good information out there, but it seems to be segmented, and I needed just how to do it. So I okay. leather for my face. So that's the, 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 the leather tab that it uses? keeps it below and makes it so that your index finger doesn't have so much yep. push on that, the that's a pretty standard technique a bit modified to uh, course, reduce clearance can be made and it basically strings walk of it okay on this side of this, this isn't new it can be done now this this is what the mongolians do today Set the string walk a lot long a lot lot lower. And that, that's a left handed bow. Okay. That, 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 that's the right hand bow now, is it? Okay. Okay. I'm not convinced, Space. Because um, you said that the, my video didn't age well, apparently, because my video came out afterwards. Now, I disagree with your comment um, that the video is no longer relevant or what you're implying. I'm not sure what you implied in the comment, but the thing is that one, he's not shooting Olympic style. Yes, he's shooting with a modern bow, but he's, he's not shooting Olympic target archery. So he's not exposing himself to the challenge of shooting what, 72 hours in a row using a thumb draw on target using a target technique um so he can he can be accurate yes but i don't recall claiming that you couldn't be accurate with a thumb draw what i said in the video was that the thumb draw confers no advantage over a conventional three finger draw and what um, shot iq said very specifically was he wanted to challenge himself so it's not a superior method, and it doesn't really offer anything that you can't already do with a Mediterranean draw. So that's why I'm not entirely sure why you raise this as a potential counterpoint. 
because again the Mongolian archers today in the in the Nadam games shoot on the left side with a thumb draw. So that's already known. Not sure if it's well known, but it's already uh, known. Um, the things that it can be done, it just doesn't bring any benefit to it. The only reason he did it is because he wants to challenge himself by using a different technique, which arguably is inferior. Uh, if you do it that way, and this is, I don't know a lot of people have put value in unorthodox techniques, but you know anyone who shoots with a Mediterranean draw will shoot just as good, if not better, than what he can. So he can make it work. It doesn't mean that it's an effective technique compared to um, most uh, draw techniques. So again, that, that video didn't really dispel my preconceived notions. Yeah, I mean, as long as you have an anchor point, you can be accurate. I mean, it's why you have the traditional archery styles, like uh, um, Chinese archery. You watch um, Justin Ma, he anchors behind his ear. He can shoot a 7 meter target just fine. So as long as your technique is good, you're fine. Uh, Benjamin, yes. Uh, there are ways to like generate, like like calculate and print a sight tape, but in terms of the, the best, easiest way is to do a walk back. Yeah, of course. That's how you do a sight. You know, you sight and then you write down your sight settings and you mark them on your target or your sight tape. Uh, Adam. How significantly would past battles be affected if medieval, uh, medieval archers and access to modern compound bows? So here's the thing with a modern compound bow. If in, in my theory, it would be similar to muskets and riflemen during the Napoleonic era. So you'd still have um, a lot of people using longbows for volume of fire, because the compound bow isn't shot as quickly, it takes a bit more time and care. Um, the, with a compound bow, you wouldn't, it's, it will turn into a sniper weapon, because a, a, a longbow shooter uh, would have to, they can't shoot as accurately, they can shoot accurately, not as accurately. A compound bow would allow an archer to be more precise on a point target than um, if uh, you had a heavier, clumsier weapon that you had to make work very, uh, finally. Whereas the compound weapon is a weapon of finesse. Um, so you would probably have um, people who are specialized in long distance point shooting, like snipers, or um, probably designated, designated marksmen is probably the best um, uh, description of compounds and longbows. So you would have the longbows providing the, um, the base of fire, in modern terms, and then you have the DMRs um, who are using compound bows. That's, my, that's what I think. It wouldn't change battle significantly because archers seldom turn the tide of battle. What it would mean is that um, leaders like captains and lords might be a lot more at risk, especially if you had sights. That's what would change it a lot. Um, because you have the means in which um, you could pick out a target and shoot very accurately. Whereas even at close distance, while archers could be quite accurate, it was still hit or miss. And most archers miss their targets because um, you couldn't aim the point target that accurately. You would get within a very close distance, but you wouldn't necessarily hit a particular spot. Whereas a good compound shooter um, with a sight, could hit a point target um, probably like 85% of the time at um, most distances. So that, that's what will probably change is you'll probably see more assassination on the battlefield or outside the battlefield as compared to um, just you know shooting um, in a line. Blitz, I don't hunt, so I nor do I use a compound. So this is a question which I can't answer on two degrees. I don't have tips for Turkish archery. I'm not the person to ask. Um, look at um, Aitan, the forum.
often they've missed, well, compound shooters, not that miss. But you shouldn't have a, a weapon that's more capable of shooting long distance accurately. Another interesting thing is that um, compound arrows are much faster and thinner, so they can actually go through mail. So whereas other arrows have to split mail to penetrate armor, a compound arrow can just go right through it. Because the, the narrowness, the, thin, the thinness of the shaft is much thinner than a medieval shaft. If you're using like carbon arrows, you can get through um, mail just by um, going through the mail. Much easier. A video from Skullagrim tested that. He used a, a, cross, a, a compound bow to shoot through um, riveted mail. And uh, only the, the uh, medieval crossbow couldn't penetrate. The modern co crossbow could. Uh, and the, uh, the one compound could, I believe. So modern arrows have a slight edge in that regard. But this is closest to testing. You wouldn't obviously aim for this um, in real life. Do I like whisking arrows? I don't... I don't have one. I haven't used one. Not sure. If, you, you, you've got to stop asking my opinion on things I don't do, right? This is every live stream. What do you think of bow fishing? What do you think of this archery? What do you think of that archery? I don't have an opinion. You, you, you've got to realize this to me. Right? I, I, I'm not going to provide an opinion that I don't have. I'm not like most people who stream and have an opinion to stir up the pot or whatever. But I, I, I don't have an opinion on an object. It's kind of like, what, what's your opinion on this brass weight? Uh, it's a brass weight. I don't have an opinion. It's brass and it has a weight to it. So um, I know this is going to be, this, this isn't a very interesting answer, but this is real life. I'm not going to um, go in a soapbox and go on a 20 minute rant about a particular arrow type just because th there are things I can be triggered by, but those are things I have legitimate opinions on. Um, whereas I don't have a lot of attachments to tools and things, you know, I, I don't really have favorites of much, um, or preferences in that sense. So do I like whistling arrows? I like it as much as any other arrow. I reckon we'll end it there. It's been one and a half hours now. I think the, uh, the questions have dried up. So, um, thank you all for joining me. Um, again, uh, if you are watching this and you haven't already sent a shirt in, I'm very happy to accept shirts. I will do a different announcement for this uh, later on. Uh, but uh, otherwise, uh, thank you all for joining me. Um, this again is the last live stream before the 100k mark. So uh, when that happens, I'm not sure what I'm going to do apart from posting on Facebook. I don't know. I don't celebrate these things. But uh, it's a pretty big mark milestone so uh, when it happens it happens otherwise i'm very happy to end it here thank you all for following me tonight do enjoy the rest of the day wherever you are thank you all for watching this is new sensei and i will see you all next time